When we think of war, we usually conceive of it as a contest between two or more nations. Like black and white on a chessboard, or red force and blue force at an exercise, it can be tempting to think of nations and their allies as monolithic teams, each acting with a single purpose to try and obtain victory. But of course, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Governments, militaries, armies, nations, all of these are complex systems. And like so many complex systems, they all suffer from a common flaw. Namely, they're all made up of people. And humans have an annoying habit of having their own thoughts, own identities, and own personal interests. And wherever you find people and power structures, you will also find politics and personal interests. There will always be incentives to build your power or the power of your allies at the expense of others. In most countries, there'll be an attempt to put in place systems and cultures that hold those most destructive impulses back. But in countries like Russia, those forces are just part of the system. They're part of the glue that holds the whole thing together. In peacetime, this dizzying array of private armies and dueling military structures did a lot to help secure Putin's power. But in Ukraine, the resulting patchwork of private military companies, the official army, proxies, paramilitaries, voluntary units, and everything else in between has proven to be less than efficient at its primary role. Wagner and the Russian Ministry of Defense feud openly online, and political battles for influence have seen the leadership of the entire operation change several times. It's the age-old story of politics and self-interest undermining the jointness and effectiveness of a military force. And today we're going to explore how and why. So today I'm going to start with the why first. Why power and incentive structures can lead to this sort of damaging fragmentation in any organization, but also why there's specific features of systems like those that exist in Russia make these things not just likely, but almost inevitable. Then I'm going to look at some of the ways in which it's damaged Russian performance in Ukraine, the way it hampered reforms before the war, how it created duplicative and wasteful structures, how it hampered coordination, and even in some cases has led to direct skullduggery, allegedly. There are two big caveats to attach to this. The first is that while this is a presentation primarily about Russia, this is not a uniquely Russian problem. Just like corruption, this can be a problem anywhere, and I talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation. The second is that because the Kremlin does not exactly release daily reports on the results of its infighting, everything in this presentation should be considered to be allegedly or reportedly or both. I'm working with the best information I have available, but I certainly don't claim perfect or special knowledge of the things that go on inside the halls of Russian power. So now, before we jump into it, a word from today's sponsor. And today I'd like to welcome back returning sponsor and my VPN of choice, Private Internet Access. Now I want to be clear, VPNs are not some internet magic that make you invulnerable to every threat out there. It won't make your terrible password any better, it won't stop you from clicking on things you shouldn't, and it won't turn that crypto scam in the comments section into a legitimate offer. But what they can give you is an easy way to hide your IP address and improve your online privacy, especially on less secure networks. Because connecting to public Wi-Fi somewhere like an airport can be a bit like going up in an airplane that skipped a maintenance cycle. You might be okay, but you'd probably rather the airline played it safe. Using a VPN, one or two clicks can conceal your IP address, adjust your perceived location, and improve your internet privacy. And to me, that's enough to make them an essential part of my toolkit. I started using private internet access a while ago, and I'm glad I did. To protect user privacy, they've got an audited and court-proven policy of not logging user activity. Their code base is open to public scrutiny, and it's both easy to use and compatible with a range of streaming services. If you need to adjust your geography while streaming, private internet access has servers in 84 countries. And if content is locked to a particular US state, well, PIA has servers in 50 of them. And if you're interested, you can access a special offer through a code in the description. With protection for up to 10 devices, a 30-day money-back guarantee, and a discount of up to 83% on a two-year subscription, plus four additional bonus months, it's well worth checking out. So to start with this topic, we need to understand the why. Why do politics ruin everything? Why do people often have an incentive to act against the interests of their business, their government, or whatever group they're a part of? At its most basic level, the problem here is that of incentives. The fact that what is best for you may not be best for your organization or your country. And that can be a reality all the way from the apex of political power down to the level of like a school sports team. Let's just say I'm the leader of a political party in government and it's my turn to appoint some judges or the people running an anti-corruption watchdog. The interests of the country is for me to appoint someone 
experienced, dogged, determined, who will fulfil that function to the very letter, support my country's institutions. But on the other hand, that might cause me and my party problems later, so I should probably just appoint my mate Dave, who I went to law school with, because he'll know to make the right judgments. It's not necessarily corruption, it's perfectly legal, but it represents a difference between my interests and the interests of the country. Similarly, democracy in my country might be best supported by drawing, you know, sensible, reasonable electoral boundaries. But if my political future will be better preserved by drawing something that looks more like a Picasso, then maybe that's what I'm going to do. At the other end of the spectrum, that incentives problem can go all the way down to the level of an individual employee. Imagine you are a data worker at a company, for example, and you come up with a way to automate your own job. That would be fantastic for the company, for the organisation. It would save your salary and make things more efficient. But then there'd be no job for you now, would there? So maybe you just don't automate your job and carry on as is, or you do automate your position and don't tell anyone so that you can spend your entire day on Reddit while still being very, quote, productive. Well-designed systems and good cultures might be able to mitigate some of these problems, but it's very hard to eliminate this incentive mismatch entirely. And one problem organisations or countries can face with this sort of culture is that where there is a mismatch between personal incentive and the interests of the system, those differences can widen over time. Think about it this way. If a system rewards the wrong thing, say it rewards people who actively sabotage their opponents in a business, and those people make it to the top, well then those are the people who are going to decide the rules of the game, so to speak, going forward. And if you're someone who won the game playing by certain rules, well then you're probably more likely than most to agree that those rules are perfectly fine. If you're in business and you get to the top by actively sabotaging your co-workers, well, when you get to the top, you're likely to believe that that sort of competition is healthy, because you probably think that you're a good leader who deserves everything they got, and that's a healthy culture. If you're a politician and you make it to the top through ruthless negative campaigning and refusing to ever work with the opposition, well, then you're likely to select and favour other candidates and others in your party who believe the same way, because it worked for you. And so an organisation can evolve in the wrong direction over time. To give you a ridiculous hypothetical to illustrate this point, imagine for the moment an accounting firm. This accounting firm is in Australia, and so sport is really important to the firm culture. So one day the boss comes back from a trip to the United States and decides that every year there's going to be a basketball tournament in the firm, everyone has to compete, those in the worst teams all get fired, those in the good teams get to stay, and all the best performers in the games, well, those people get promoted. Now give that firm a couple of years and they're going to be recruiting an awful lot of six foot five accountants to try and make sure that their team survives the coming cull. And once all the senior leadership is made up of people who can sink mad three-pointers from halfway, well they're all probably going to think that the basketball-based selection system is perfectly fine. Now clients would probably prefer that these individuals had at least some decent accounting skills. And in a good democracy with a free and open press, the role of those clients is played by the body politic, by the voters, who would probably prefer their politicians are reasonably good at their jobs and conduct themselves with at least a basic degree of honesty. But in this hypothetical example, basketball skills are now king because that's what the incentive structure rewards above all else. And so when a political or a military or a corporate system rewards and encourages the wrong things, things can go downhill quickly. And so we come to the Russian political system and the problem of personalist structures in general. That is a situation where most of the power, or all of the power, is concentrated in one person at the top. When most power rests with one person, checks and balances and competing power structures are weakened, well then the only opinion that matters, the primary incentive, is that of the boss. And the interests of the nation or the public well, those are subordinated to the personal interests of whoever is in charge. So congratulations, Comrade President, you are now in charge. You're the boss. And since being in charge is a pretty good gig, your primary goal is probably now just to remain in power. As long as you can do that safely, you might want to achieve some good for the nation as well, but your primary goal is to remain in power. So think for a moment. How on earth could you lose your power if you're the boss, if you're in charge? Well, there's a couple of ways that this can happen. The first is that all your subordinates, or a majority of them, unite against you. You may be the most powerful person in the room, but you exercise power by issuing instructions to people. You don't hold a gun, you don't drive a tank, you issue an order to someone who issues an order to someone else who might drive a tank or hold a gun. If those people one day get together and decide they don't like you and then you're on the out, well then you're on the out. And even if they don't unite, a sufficiently powerful, popular or capable subordinate 
might be able to throw you out on their own. Stalin, for example, was always scared of popular generals, people like Zhukov, because if someone is in charge of the army, is popular with the public, well, that person might get ideas. Meanwhile, the third threat is if you run the country so badly that eventually people's hatred of you overcomes their fear of you, well, you may be thrown out by the general population and find yourself hanging from a lamppost. So, boss, with all of that in mind and a great desire to avoid any lampposts in your future, what are you going to look for in a subordinate? Well, to avoid issue one, you want people who are loyal above all. Loyalty is the single most important attribute because if they're loyal to you, they won't unite against you. But just to be sure they don't unite, you're going to want to pick people who actively compete against or hate each other. If they hate each other more than they hate you, well, they can't unite against you. In terms of the competence of your subordinates, you probably don't want complete idiots, because if they run the country into the ground, well then, popular revolution is a threat and you're not going to be able to accomplish any of your national objectives. But people are, who are too smart or too good at their jobs, they're dangerous too, because they might build an independent power base, they might get too popular, they might become an individual threat. So all else being equal, the boss probably wants people who have a moderate level of competence, and he also wants people who can serve as convenient scapegoats if things go wrong. One Russian I've spoken to has said that in Russia, successes have many parents and failures are orphans. And a long-standing feature of the Russian political system, and many other systems to be fair, is that it's never the boss's fault when something goes wrong. No, it's always the fault of some local official or some scapegoat in the middle. It can never be the Tsar's fault, it can never be Stalin's fault, it can never be the President's fault. It's a phenomenon you see when Russian mobilised personnel, for example, record videos appealing directly to Putin and blaming local officials or local military commanders for their terrible conditions. As long as you as the boss have a steady supply of scapegoats, well any failure can be met by simply punishing the scapegoats and continuing as before. Meanwhile, if you're a political or a military leader, but not the boss, you also have a number of incentives, not all of which perfectly align with the public interest. Your key objective is, because you want to survive and prosper, is you need the favour of the boss. The boss could end your career at any moment, the boss could throw you under the bus as a scapegoat, so you need the boss on side. You also need to be able to overcome any challenges, whether they be within your structure, so from your subordinates, or from the leaders of other power structures. That means you need to build allies and a power base so you can survive in this dog-eat-dog -dog world of the upper echelons of power. And of course, in an ideal world, you'll get a couple of yachts and mansions along the way. After all, what is power without its perks? Now the key here is that being good at your job or achieving national goals is not contrary to any of these objectives except for maybe the yachts. Winning public popularity for doing a good job is going to increase the strength of your power base. It's going to help protect you from criticism by your competitors, and it's going to make you useful to the boss. But it's not the primary driving incentive. Survival and advancement is. It means you also need to prize loyalty in your subordinates. And it means that doing a good job is always going to be secondary to winning the great game. And as we're about to see, the rules of that game have hampered the Russian army in more ways than one. So if all that sounded theoretical, let's start making it real beginning by looking at how this system of political incentives and factionalism has damaged the process of reform in the Russian army long before it set foot in Ukraine. And to begin this story, we need to go back to the 1990s, some of the darkest days for the Russian army. The Soviet army was gone, the funding for the new Russian army had evaporated, its privileged position in society was gone, and the civilian government didn't really trust the army. Although, to be fair, trying to stage a coup does tend to have a negative impact on people's trust levels. Under these circumstances, with the army in deep crisis, with there basically being no money to go around, with organised crime running rampant, Yeltsin hypothetically could have chosen a competent, capable officer who could navigate the unprecedented challenges of transitioning the Russian army from its Soviet roots into something more suited for modern Russia. But this is Slavic history and happy endings are banned, so Yeltsin instead chose Pavel Sergeyevich Grashev. Grashev's primary qualification for the role was, well, loyalty. In 1991, he was ostensibly part of the coup attempt, but he pulled some Game of Thrones shit and changed sides. 
He built a personal friendship with Boris Yeltsin, and two years later, when Yeltsin faced a constitutional crisis and the army wavered on whether to support him or the parliament, Grushev threw in with Yeltsin. Which I suppose is a significant part of the reason why Yeltsin said in late 1994 that Pavel here was the best defence minister of the decade. And during peacetime, that loyalty and friendship is what mattered. It mattered a lot less that the defence minister was allegedly enormously corrupt and also incompetent. Or at least it didn't matter until the First Chechen War broke out. In December 1994, the Russian army went into the small Republic of Chechnya to make sure it didn't break away from the Russian Federation. Chechnya had no regular army, a population of about a million people, and was matched against the full might of the Russian army, and the Russian army got wrecked. On New Year's Eve, Russian armoured columns tried to storm the Chechen capital of Grozny, only to be torn apart by Chechen militia and irregulars. Hundreds of armoured vehicles were destroyed, burned out, or captured, and Russian morale fell through the floor. Now stop me if you've heard this one before, but after failing to take the city by storm, the Russian army fell back on a protracted artillery and air bombardment campaign that levelled most of Grozny and eventually enabled them to take the city. Only to then lose the city again in August 1996, when a massively outnumbered Chechen force was able to throw out the much larger Russian occupation group. Deep issues with the Russian military had been exposed at every level. Training, morale, management, equipment, tactics, doctrine. And the result is that most commentators consider the First Chechen War to be an embarrassing Russian defeat. Thousands of Russian soldiers were killed, tens of thousands of civilians lost their lives, significant parts of Chechnya were levelled or inflicted with unexploded ordnance, and as for the Minister of Defence who oversaw it all, he was fired and made the head of one of the organisations at the heart of Russia's military industry. After the First Chechen War, it was clear that some reforms of the Russian military were necessary, but for a while the ministers of defence took different approaches to this particular problem, some of which really could be topics all of their own. Igor Sergeyev is a very interesting example. He was a former Strategic Rocket Forces officer before he was made the Minister of Defence. So, surprise, surprise, once being made the Minister of Defence, he decided that the strategic rocket forces and nuclear weapons were critical. His idea was that if there wasn't enough money available for Russia to possibly have an army that could equal NATO, then all Russia really needed to guarantee its security against a NATO invasion or attack was up-to-date nuclear missile systems, because who's going to invade a country with top-of-the-range nuclear weapons? He also abolished the ground forces headquarters, which technically could be interpreted as demoting the army below the navy and the air force, which was an interesting move for a primarily land power. But the one I really want to talk about is Anatoly Serdyukov. Serdyukov comes in around about 2008. He's an ex-taxes minister with law and economics degrees, and he is an absolute bulldozer when it comes to reform arguing that Russia at this point was spending a lot of money on the armed forces but not seeing much modernization, he implements a range of controls. He starts monitoring how the military is spending its money. It increases oversight at every level and diminishes the control of the general staff over spending. He fired a suite of top officers and planned a very ambitious reform scheme. His idea was to build a smaller, more professional, more capable modern army to reduce the number of officers dramatically, to eliminate most of the old structures, so divisions for example, and move over to a brigade-based system. He wanted to reform officer education to look less like the old Soviet academy system and more like the way Western countries educate their officers. And by cutting the size of the army and reducing the officer corps by something like 58%, he hoped to build something more modern, more agile, and more effective. Meanwhile, while he was making great friends by firing everybody, he also picked a fight with the defence industry, which he accused of basically under-delivering and overpricing everything. He wanted to push them on price, he wanted to introduce competition, even if that meant going overseas if Russian industry wasn't prepared to make a good enough offer. By 2012, he wanted a 1 million strong force with a professional non-commissioned officer corps and primarily modern equipment. So I bet you can see where this is all going. So Dukov's reforms pissed off a considerable number of people, notably the defence industry that was now facing increased competition, including from foreign imports, and the officer corps that were being trimmed in number, having a lot of their structures and relevant perks eliminated, and their education system reformed. 
Now, to be fair, not all of his ideas were good ones. Some of them turned out badly. Getting rid of the Russian military's warrant officers, for example, probably wasn't a good idea. Sedyukov was also accused of corruption, like getting the military to build a road to a property I believe he owned. And so he was pushed out, only to be pardoned later. Because you see, it's okay to be corrupt in the upper echelons of Russian power, but it's not okay to be corrupt and make a whole bunch of enemies. And so, with Sadyukov pushed out, there needed to be a new Minister of Defence. And his replacement was none other than Sergei Shoigu. Now, you might remember Sergei Shoigu if you watched my video on corruption. Sergei had been the Minister of Emergency Situations since 1994. In 1999, he was involved in the political party Unity, which helped facilitate Vladimir Putin's rise. And coincidentally, in 1999, he also became a hero of the Russian Federation. In 2012, after Sedyukov is pushed out, he becomes the Minister of Defense. Sergei had established himself as something of a popular public figure by virtue of his time dealing with emergency situations and by virtue of having a great PR team. He's also an incredibly industrious individual who somehow managed to allegedly find himself in possession of an $18 million mansion while working for a salary of a bit over 100 grand per year, which does suggest some truly impressive financial management skills. Now, Sergei enjoys a much better relationship with the military and military industry than his predecessor did. I wonder if that has anything to do with the fact that he, you know, sort of hit the brakes a little bit on many of Sedyukov's reforms. Some of the education changes were reversed, the officer cuts, while there were still cuts, they were reduced. Some of the structures that were due to be eliminated, while well, those were restored, and there were a range of other measures that benefited officers as well. Sedyukov had wanted an officer lean force with professional NCOs. By 2016, the Russian army, well, 26% of its uniform strength were officers. For comparison, the figure is about 18% in the USA, and that includes warrant officers. Also importantly, there's a truce between Sergei and the defense industry. The threat of foreign imports is reduced, and the contract money flows. As a result, new systems begin arriving with the Russian military. But one could argue a significant part of the reason why is because the money flows freely as well. It wasn't a complete reversal of the reform process, but certainly fell far short of what was originally imagined. Now, I'm sure there are those out there that would argue that Sergei is a bad defense minister or an idiot. Strelkov regularly calls him the plywood marshal, and many have been critical of his tenure as Minister of Defense. Some might argue, for example, that he allowed corruption to fester, that the equipment modernization process was delayed and incomplete under his tenure, that the mobilization and reserve structures were allowed to completely atrophy, and that in relation to the war in Ukraine, that he failed to test the plan appropriately, that he was one of the people who probably knew the invasion was going to happen, and as a result, he probably bears some responsibility for the fact it was a giant shit show. The Ukrainian Ministry of Defense allegedly sent him a letter thanking him for allowing corruption to fester in the Russian military, and so for these reasons, many might be tempted to label Sergei Shoigu a failure. After all, they argue he was the Minister of Defense who built and armed forces that were ill-prepared for a campaign like the one in Ukraine, and then signed off on a plan that committed them to exactly that sort of fight. Clearly, some would argue that makes Sergei incompetent. But I would argue from the system's point of view, there's another way to think about this. One where Sergei is in fact a genius. Sergei Shoigu wasn't born in Moscow or St. Petersburg. He was born in Tuva, far from the center of power. In 1988, he was a minor functionary in the Communist Party. But by 1991, he was head of the Rescue Corps, which was basically the civil defense troops. By 1993, he was a major general, and then he was promoted in 95, 98, and by 2003, this guy from Tuva was a four-star general. He has served in every Russian government since 1991. He has survived every purge, every political maneuver. He has established a public presence, and his family appears to have acquired a whole bunch of wealth from somewhere. Even better, after nearly a year in Ukraine where things haven't exactly gone to plan, who's left standing? Sergei Shoigu and Valery Gerasimov. So from the point of view of the average Russian soldier, Sergei is incompetent. But as far as the incentives and structure of the political system go, he's amazing. He's valued for his loyalty to Vladimir Putin. He's been able to see off challenges from others in the political system and represent himself as the sort of person who can be trusted to control the armed forces. 
Shoigu doesn't hold his position despite being a bad Minister of Defence, he holds his position because he is a good Russian politician. But politics and perverted incentives don't just go to who you hand power or what decisions you make, it can encourage you to build organisations that are bloated, duplicative and inefficient. Generally speaking, whether you're in business or government, doing things efficiently means designing a structure correctly, avoiding duplication and doing things at scale. If I'm in business, I probably only need one HR area, one legal area, one area handling my procurement and whatever shared services are out there. In a military too, you want a logical organisational and command structure that does the mission efficiently. If you're designing an organisation, well, your first question is, what are you trying to accomplish? What is your organisation or your nation's strategy? What configuration is the most logical? What makes the most sense? And where should you dedicate your resources to get the best bang for your buck? If Rob from Sales knows he has some talented specialists who would be more productive if they transferred and worked for Susie from Projects, then that's where they should go. They should go wherever they are most productive. But in many organisations, you could argue that by giving up resources, Rob's being a bit of an idiot. It might be a great idea from an organisational perspective, but what about from a personal one? With fewer resources, it might be harder for Rob's team to do its job and hit its targets. And in some organisations, a person's influence and importance is tied to how many staff they have and how large their budget is. And so the incentive is to build empires, to make oneself and one's team indispensable. If you operate a critical piece of technology, then don't share that knowledge, hold it close so that you're irreplaceable. If you have precious resources, then guard them preciously. And in places like government or the military where no one is expected to run at a profit, well, they can be even more vulnerable to this sort of thinking. An ideal military from an organisational perspective is probably sleek and designed to generate the maximum possible economies of scale. It shares precious skills widely to maximise the benefit. It freely shares and exchanges information within the limits of security to make sure the whole organisation can take advantage of it. It probably has a strong mission-focused culture and sense of duty and is basically a large unified force acting as one organism towards a single goal, basically like any nation ever played in a video game. But if you remember our guidelines for being an effective autocrat, it's also a pretty stupid idea. A unified capable military probably means a commander of a unified capable military who would pose an unacceptable threat to the leadership. It's also a real threat to any political figure that isn't a leader in that army. Because if political competition ever gets heated, the smart money is usually on the guy with the tanks and the guns rather than, I don't know, the tax department. Audit documents don't usually do a very good job of stopping tank rounds. And so what you'll often see in countries with personalist systems is that they will deliberately fragment their military. And so far as historical examples go, Germany during World War II is actually a fantastic example. Germany during the Second World War was a feudal mess of organisations with duplicative responsibilities that were actively encouraged to compete. From a political perspective, this made perfect sense. Organisations that competed against each other would be reliant on Hitler to play arbiter, thus protecting his power at the very top. I've got photographs there of German tanks, but they are not part of the same army because Germany in World War II has two parallel ground combat arms. It has the Heer, the German army, and it also has the Waffen SS, which are the armed wing of the Nazi SS. An SS Panzer Division and an Army Panzer Division have essentially the same battlefield role, but they had different organisation, different recruitment processes, different headquarters, different uniforms, different equipment priorities, different logistics, the list goes on. And the fight for recruits and replenishment was constant. As you can imagine, having two different armies that do basically the same thing wasn't particularly efficient. But from a political perspective, it made sense. The SS didn't completely trust the army, the army didn't completely trust the SS, and so they both held on to their own combat arms. And hey, just for a moment, let's play a little guessing game. Here's a photo of a German infantryman in 1942, and based just on his uniform, I would like you to guess, is he a member of the army or of the Waffen SS? And some of you are already yelling at me because it is in fact a trick question. He's in the Air Force. The so-called Luftwaffe field divisions were raised in significant numbers from late 1942 onwards. What had happened is because of the fighting on the Eastern Front, the German army realised it would need a lot more personnel and requested that they be transferred from other services to help them make up numbers. But Goering and the Luftwaffe didn't want to transfer personnel over to the army and so they put forward a plan to raise their own infantry divisions instead. That way they could preserve their power and influence. 
And so something like 200,000 Luftwaffe personnel found themselves grouped into field divisions. Now unsurprisingly, it turns out that the Air Force is less effective at forming infantry units than the Army is. And given their poor reputation and distinctive Luftwaffe field blue uniforms, the Soviets learned to pick on these units pretty relentlessly. Eventually, everyone learned their lessons and the units were transferred over to the Army. But that didn't stop the Luftwaffe from maintaining control of a tank division until May 1945 when it surrendered to the Soviet Army. Nor did it stop the same saga playing out all over again in late 1944. By this point, it was very clear that everything was going downhill and the decision was made to form the Volkssturm, a mass levied militia of the very young and very old to serve as a last ditch defence for the German homeland. So with Germany's back against the wall, the question was which army would be responsible for raising, training and commanding the Volkssturm? The SS? The army? Heck, maybe even the Air Force, they still had a tank division at this point. And the answer the Germans came to was to place the Volkssturm under the command of local Nazi party officials. Because politics and power games were never going to give way to military necessity, even as the bombs rained down on the German Reich. Now I'm not saying this fragmentation made the individual forces useless, but I am saying all these systems were duplicative, wasteful, and made sense from a political perspective, not from a military or a logistics one. Which means it's time to head back to modern Russia, introduce some of the major figures, and the forces that they command. On one hand you have the regular military, and specifically the regular army, most commonly represented by the Minister of Defence, Sergei Shoigu, and the Chief of the General Staff, Valery Gerasimov, who is now the commander of Russian forces in Ukraine as well. Under its control, the MOD umbrella are the ground forces, the navy, the aerospace forces, the strategic rocket forces, the airborne forces, the list goes on. And these are Russia's primary combat forces, but historically they've been viewed, as we've discussed before, with some degree of political suspicion. And so Russia has a second force of troops focused on internal security. Roskvadia takes over many of the duties you'd associate with the old Soviet internal troops. It has a domestic focus. In 2021, it had a moderate reported strength of merely 340,000 personnel. And like any good police or internal security force, it had about 1,600 armoured vehicles and an artillery regiment. In a crisis, Roskvadia can take over command of individual military units as well with a presidential order. And who you might wonder has Putin selected to lead the Roskvadia? Well, that would be Viktor Zolotov. And if you're wondering what qualifies Mr. Zolotov to lead an organisation of more than a third of a million men and women with more armoured vehicles than many militaries, uh, well, he was Yeltsin's bodyguard, and then he was Putin's sparring partner, uh, and then he was Putin's chief of security until 2013, which obviously made him fully qualified to become Minister of Internal Affairs in 2014 and to take over command of the National Guard in 2016. In short, he has very little in the way of relevant experience, but you don't appoint someone your chief of security for 13 years without trusting them. There was also another armed force, or rather pair of armed forces, that weren't officially part of the Russian army until well after the February invasion, and this is the armed forces of the so-called DNR and LNR. Russia leaned very heavily on these troops through much of 2022, and really paid the price for the fact that they were officially separate from the Russian army. Without access to the Russian treasury, full access to Russian armories and training grounds, many DNR and LNR units were more poorly trained, worse equipped, and worse paid than they otherwise might have been. In part, as a result, casualties were very, very high. From a manpower's perspective, that was incredibly wasteful. But politically, the separation of these forces from the Russian army long made sense. Politically, it meant that Russia didn't have to take responsibility for their actions, nor take responsibility for the casualties that they suffered. Even keeping these states separate, so having Donetsk and Luhansk separate and keeping their forces generally pretty poorly armed, had an arguably a political purpose, keeping them both reliant and dependent on Moscow. But it also hampered joint operations and military effectiveness. On more than one occasion, it was reported that troops from Donetsk refused to go and fight in the territory of Luhansk, and troops from Luhansk refused to go fight on the territory of Donetsk. And when it came to leadership again, loyalty and political connections probably mattered more than competence. Denis Pushilin, who was the ostensible head of the DNR for a number of years, while his primary pre-war qualifications include running a massive Ponzi scheme between 1989 and 1994, then running another Ponzi scheme in 2011 to 2013, or rather being involved in one, allegedly, 
running in the December 2013 elections in Ukraine and winning 0.08% of the vote. Truly, Russia was sending its best. But these are just the forces that officially existed, that officially served the Russian Federation or its proxy states, the DNR and LNR. What about those that fit more into the category of private forces? Now let's be clear, private military companies, mercenaries, household armies, these things are illegal under Russian law. There's a provision in the Russian constitution which prohibits the establishment of organisations, the objective of which is to create armed units among other things. Acting as a mercenary is also illegal under the criminal code. And this explains why you can go on the internet, find the website for Russian private military corporations, and express your interest in hiring their services. I've often seen analysts argue that the illegality of these organisations is in fact a political tool in its own. If an organisation is illegal, then you have the ability to just arrest all of its members and wind it up if it ever ceases to be useful to you. And it means they can only exist as long as those in power permit them to. Which brings us to our first figure, Ramzan Kadyrov, who has managed to make his private army at least legal on the surface. Kadyrov is officially the head of the Chechen Republic. His dad was a major resistance leader who fought against the Russians. In 1995, Kadyrov said, if every Chechen kills 150 Russians, we will win, owing to the 150 to 1 population ratio. But in 1999, the Kadyrovs switched sides and were instrumental to victory for the Russians in the Second Chechen War. Kadyrov's father, Ahmad, was assassinated in 2004, and because modern governments are apparently monarchies, uh, that meant Ramzan was now in charge. Now, I could make an entire video making fun of Ramzan Kadyrov. This is a guy who made a video of him slow motion running away from oncoming four-wheel drives before firing a machine gun into the air. This is a guy who leads one of the poorest places in Russia, and yet somehow seems to, you know, always manage to accumulate a whole bunch of wealth. After his gala 2011 birthday party that brought together figures like Jean-Claude Van Damme and Hilary Swank, Kadyrov probably held the prize for weirdest Hollywood crossover, until the Belarusian president Lukashenko invited Steven Seagal over and gave him a carrot. Kadyrov is highly hawkish in Russian politics, has been highly critical of the MOD, he was supportive of the former commander in Ukraine, Sergei Surovikin, and he's also one of those guys who's threatened, for example, Poland, saying that after they're done with Ukraine, Poland is next. And to help protect his influence, one thing Kadyrov has done with the money flowing to him from Moscow is establish a large, loyal, and very well-equipped personal guard. These Chechen troops are usually very easy to recognise, most of them wear full beards, and they tend to have much blingier equipment than their Russian army equivalents. While Russian regular infantry don't tend to have things like optics on their rifles, Kadyrov's troops, well, they look like they've got the full tactical setup. Now as a warning, it would technically be wrong to call these units Kadyrov's private troops. Officially, on paper, they're part of official Russian fort structures, Many of their units are part of, for example, Roskvadia. But I'd humbly suggest that when you're talking about units that put the Kadyrov name on their insignia, the face of his dad on their unit's flags, that are recruited almost solely from populations and areas considered loyal to him, that maybe, just maybe, the loyalty of these units is more focused on Kadyrov himself than the Roskvadia command structure. And that, that gives Kadyrov influence. Nothing builds political acumen like a small army on your payroll. But if you're going to talk about people with an army on their payroll, it's impossible not to talk about Yevgeny Prigozhin and the Wagner Group. And we've talked about Prigozhin before. He served time in prison, but then when he got out, he got rich off catering contracts with the Russian government. Having made his money in catering, he decided to move into other traditional business areas, like running a mercenary group, likely in cooperation with the GRU. And it is Wagner Group that has driven Prigozhin's rise in power and influence over the last 12 months. Now, Wagner really could be a video all of its own, but here is the cliff notes. Because private military corporations are illegal, Wagner obviously doesn't exist, which is why it has T-90M and T-90S tanks, heavy artillery, the ability to recruit prisoners directly from Russian prisons, a massive HQ in the centre of Russia, and is integrated directly into Russian war planning. Now, there is actually a Wagner corporate registration in Russia, I believe, for management consultancy services. 
So I'm really looking forward to seeing these guys pitch their solutions against PwC or McKinsey next time you have a business problem. That gentleman in the lower right-hand corner with the SS tattoos is Dmitry Utkin, reportedly one of Wagner's commanders, awarded several medals by Putin, and he looks like someone who has fantastic PowerPoint skills. Wagner was a relatively small force before the war in Ukraine, but with recruitment from Russian prisons and elsewhere, Western intelligence agencies believe the group grew to as many as 50,000. And at places like Bakhmut and Solodar, has reportedly become one of Russia's primary offensive infantry forces. And of course, Wagner's existence as a separate organization means it has its own headquarters, its own command staff, its own recruitment pipeline, its own training facilities, and even some of its own logistics and sustainment. Then there are a mix of volunteer units, which again have their own recruitment, training, selection, and equipment processes, many of which have rather complex relationships. So, for example, there was reporting on a volunteer unit that was formed in Moscow, paid for by the Moscow city budget, at least in part, but the recruiter who was recruiting for it was linked to the Donetsk People's Militia, and they would be serving under Russian army command once they went into action. Then you've got all sorts of weird paramilitary units. Uh, the gentleman on the left in the bottom right image is a member of the Rusich military unit. They're not exactly subtle with their iconography or ideology, and they do have links allegedly both to Wagner and the People's Militia in Luhansk. But again, separate recruiting pipelines, separate training grounds, and separate political masters. And if you thought I was done, no, I have barely scratched the surface. There's a dizzying mess of private military corporations and paramilitaries active on the Russian side in Ukraine. There's a PMC that is allegedly linked directly to Sergei Shoigu himself, because it is entirely normal for the Minister of Defense to have a PMC. But this is the brutal world of Russian power politics, and if Yevgeny Prigozhin has a PMC, well then Sergei Shoigu should as well. There were unsubstantiated rumors that the Orthodox Church might be backing its own volunteer units. There's Rogozin, who we'll talk about later with his Saar Wolves. And the collective result is what one pro-Russian commentator calls a monstrous patchwork that is the Russian Federation Armed Forces. I feel like if Wagner genuinely does have a management consulting arm, then someone should hire them to do an organizational change piece to rationalize the heck out of this structure. But jokes aside, I'm not going through this list to take some cheap shot at Russia. I'm not trying to argue that all these units must be combat ineffective. Clearly Wagner has some combat capacity, for example. I'm doing it to show how political incentive and self-interest can create some truly atrocious organizational structures. From a logistics, from an organizational standpoint, this is a complete shit show. It's entirely duplicative. You have all of these different parallel systems of recruitment and training. You have different tactics being taught. You have different equipment being issued. You have different pathways for obtaining and supplying equipment. And you have parallel command structures, each with their own interests. From a purely utilitarian perspective, it would make sense to simply combine all these units together under one roof. Make use of all the training grounds to their maximum effectiveness. Use the trained personnel in one organization to help train the mobilized personnel coming into another. Streamline the supply system, all of that. But within the rules of the game, when you take account of politics and self-interest, this makes perfect sense. If all of Wagner's troops were just folded into the army, for example, what happens to Prigozhin's influence? If there were no centers of competitive power, say everything was consolidated under the army, then how would Putin divide and conquer in order to maintain his power? If there was nothing to counterbalance the army, well then how would you prevent the army in the medium to long term starting to get ideas? And so these duplicative and wasteful structures are likely to remain, because no one has any incentive to do things differently. And politics and factionalism does more than create duplicative structures that waste resources. It cuts at the core of the ability of these Russian forces to coordinate and fight as a team. As I said at the start, ideally war brings everyone on one side together to use all the forces and capabilities at their disposal in order to win the collective conflict. But whether it's in war or business, sometimes it's in an individual's interest that someone else fail sometimes even more than it's in their interest for the collective as a whole to win. To go back to our corporate example from earlier, we've already established Rob might not have any reason to share his resources with Susie. But if he and Susie are both going for the same promotion, the same role, well, things get even worse. 
because now Rob and Susie have an incentive to make sure not only that they do well, but that the other person does badly. Now, I'm not saying Rob's about to set up an IED in Susie's car or anything, but if he can find a way to make her look bad in front of a client, or maybe sabotage her work in some subtle and deniable way, then maybe that's a good idea from a personal perspective. Shifting that problem of incentives into a military context doesn't change the concept that much, it just makes the consequences that much more deadly, and increases the cost to the nation in question. Good example here is Japanese inter-service rivalry in World War II. Now, given the type of people who watch my channel, I imagine many of you already know this, but here's a quick primer if you don't. During World War II, the Japanese Army and the Japanese Navy absolutely hated each other. They were each backed by completely different zaibatsu, massive industrial conglomerates. They each had completely different ideas of how Japan should conduct itself in the world. The Army, unsurprisingly, wanted to fight a land war in Manchuria, China, and eventually the Soviet Union. The Navy, also unsurprisingly, wanted to fight a largely naval war in the Pacific. Each effectively appointed their own ministers, and inter-service assassinations were not unknown. Insubordination was possible even at a strategic level. When the Japanese Kwantung Army invaded Manchuria, it did so against the wishes of the government in Tokyo. As with Germany, this manifested in duplicative structures, which service had marines? The answer is both. Which service had paratroopers? The answer is both. Which service had an air arm? The answer is, of course, both. And which service had transport, shipping, and escorts? Again, the answer is both. In fact, the Imperial Japanese Army operated a considerable navy over the course of the war, including transport submarines and escort aircraft carriers. Of course, building these required all sorts of weird workarounds because the navy controlled the shipyards. If you're interested in the story of the Imperial Japanese Army Navy, I will link a video by Drac in the description. But more than just problems of inefficient organisation, the Imperial Japanese Army and Navy had a deep problem with coordination and cooperation at a strategic and operational and a tactical level. At a strategic level, they both wanted to fight their own war with their own objectives. And at an operational or tactical level, things like intelligence intercepts or analysis in many cases simply just wouldn't be shared, because the other service was an enemy almost as much as the Americans or the Chinese were, and heaven forbid the army give the navy a chance to look good. To cite an extreme example, the navy quite famously didn't really tell the army when it lost at Midway. And so for a while, the army continued to plan on the basis that the US had fewer ships than they actually did, and the Imperial Japanese Navy had considerably more ships than it actually did. As you can imagine, this didn't have a particularly good effect on Japan's warfighting effectiveness. But in the context of deep rivalries and political considerations, it made a twisted kind of sense for the individuals involved. Now, rivalries in modern Russia probably don't run that deep. But from what's leaked out into the public domain, it does seem like there's some pretty deep fissures between particularly Prigozhin and Wagner on one side, and Gerasimov, Shoigu, and the Russian Ministry of Defense on the other. Suffice to say, there's a number of points of tension. Going back to 2018 in Syria, for example, Russian and American forces were both operating the area. They had a deconfliction hotline to make sure neither engaged the other, and they had all sorts of lines that they had each agreed not to cross. As Wagner sources tell it, so take this with a grain of salt, between the 7th and 8th of February, some Wagner troops and Syrian government forces crossed over that metaphorical red line. The Americans and the Russians got in touch over their deconfliction hotline. The Americans asked the Russian MOD whether there were any Russian forces in the area, and the Russian MOD said no. And as a result, the Americans lit it up and a number of Wagner operators died. Now, there are a dozen other reasons that are rumoured to be involved as well. Shoigu allegedly taking away some of Prigozhin's catering contracts because he wasn't satisfied with them, which would make this one of the first civil wars ever started over catering contracts. Kadyrov has been very critical of the Ministry of Defense, and Prigozhin has often backed him up. For example, when Kadyrov criticized General Lapin earlier in the war and said that uh, the government should take away his medals and send him with a rifle to the front, Prigozhin came in, backed him up, and said, yeah, those punks should be shipped to the front barefoot with submachine guns in hand. Both Prigozhin and Kadyrov had publicly backed General Surovikin, who was recently demoted and placed under the command of Valery Gerasimov. 
And if your head is starting to spin, welcome to Russian politics. It's complicated, but suffice to say, there's some beef between Prigozhin and the Ministry of Defence. And if you want to see public evidence of how competitive these two have become, well, look no further than their commentary around the battles for Solidar and Bakhmut. Now, to do this segment, I went back and read every communication put out by the Russian Ministry of Defence on its Telegram channel in the month of January, and then went and did similar things for channels linked to Wagner Group, which was, I must say, an interesting experience. And there is night and day between the two accounts. On the 10th of January, Prigozhin comes out on Telegram, and Wagner comes out and says that Solidar has in fact been taken, and the fighting has been done entirely by Wagner units. But the next day on January 11th, the Russian Ministry of Defence comes out on its Telegram, and says that Surovikin has been demoted, Gerasimov is now in charge, Solidar hasn't been taken, fighting is still ongoing, and the focus when talking about Solidar is on units of the VDV, the airborne units, trying to block and encircle Solidar from the north and the south, while the aerospace forces strike at enemy strongholds in the area. Now that's obviously an interesting discrepancy, so I went back and looked at the other posts by the MOD. Now, some of what I found there is basically what you'd expect. There was the report of the missile strike that allegedly killed 600 Ukrainian servicemen, despite the fact that journalists in the area visited the site and found out the missile, in fact, missed the building it was aimed at. There were massive daily kill claims, including one day in which the Russians claimed five Ukrainian combat aircraft shot down. I guess if you already claim to have shot down the entire Ukrainian Air Force more than once, there's no harm in just dialing it up a notch. But in amongst the material congratulating and honouring mobilised personnel, EOD soldiers, you won't find mention of Wagner. There were more mentions lauding the work of Russian military musicians and conductors at the 102nd anniversary of the military band service of the armed forces of the Russian Federation than there were mentions of Wagner Group in relation to Solidar or Bakhmut. When the Russian MOD finally did declare Solidar captured on the 12th of January, it said the following, The capture of Solidar became possible due to the constant fire destruction of the enemy by assault and army aviation, missile troops and artillery of a group of Russian troops. They continuously inflicted strikes on the positions of the armed forces of Ukraine, preventing the transfer of reserves, blah 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 blah. Fighter aircraft of the Russian aerospace forces in the course of operations to liberate the city destroyed three aircraft and a helicopter of the Ukrainian Air Force. In addition, the combat crews of the air defence of the group of Russian troops in Solidar shot down nine rockets of HIMARS and other rocket systems fired at strongholds of Russian troops. In the course of the actions to liberate Solidar, the airborne units made a covert manoeuvre from another direction, successfully attacking the positions of the armed forces of Ukraine, occupying the dominant heights and blockading the city from the north and south sides. You get the picture. Basically, every segment of the Russian armed forces got their credit. The Air Force, the artillery, the armor, the airborne units, even the electronic warfare forces. This was a great combined arms victory for the armed forces of the Russian Federation. Meanwhile, as Wagner tells it, well, Solidar had held the Russian army up for months and then fell to them in a matter of weeks. They took it on the 10th of January and no Russian army or airborne units were involved. Wagner minted their own medal for the capture of Solidar to issue to their troops involved. Prigozhin publicly came out and accused others of trying to steal victory from Wagner PMC. And over the course of this whole thing, other accusations were made as well. One Wagner unit posted a video in which they accused the Ministry of Defence of not supplying them with adequate ammunition and calling Valery Gerasimov things that would get this video demonetized. In other cases, it's alleged, although this is impossible to confirm, that when Wagner units are on the cusp of taking a particular location, the Russian army may at times pull them back, rotate their own units in, in order to steal the victory at the last moment. The two sides even disagree over the fighting qualities of the Ukrainian army they're facing. In the Russian MOD narrative, everything is going according to plan, and the Ukrainians will shortly be defeated. Some of Prigozhin's comments suggest that the Ukrainians have their shit together, are fighting really well, and there are things the Russians could learn from them. Even that, you could argue, might be a political narrative calculated to make his perceived victory seem all the more impressive, while also undermining the reputation of the MOD. Now, you could argue that talking about this stuff is basically he said, she said over who gets to take victory for a particular battle. 
but credit and clout are valuable commodities in this sort of political system. If Putin and the public demand victories, then being a person with a reputation for being able to deliver them, well, that gives you significant power. But militarily, it drives a further wedge between these two groups of forces. To get the most out of the Russia's available forces, you'd want the Russian army and Wagner to be able to put their bodies on the line for each other. Building that sort of culture and trust is hard at the absolute best of times. Certainly more so when the two forces are actively competing for credit and seeking to sabotage each other's accomplishments. And at the extreme, those sort of political rivalries can have direct and even kinetic consequences. While most of these incidents are basically rumours and hearsay, very hard to confirm given the fog of war, there is historical precedent. There are claims, for example, from mobilised personnel that Chechen units will on occasion approach them, threaten them, and take all of their good gear for themselves. There's a claim there from a member of Rusic that mobilised units have learned to fake engagements over the radio to pretend that they're in combat so they don't have to go to the assistance of other units or put themselves in real danger. And there are allegations of rivalries at the unit level that go all the way from shit-talking on Telegram all the way up to outright firefights. Now again, that sort of stuff is hard to prove, so take those rumours with a grain of salt. But the culture that makes those stories plausible grows from the very top. Those aren't the actions of men who believe they're all on the same team together. And if we're talking about kinetic incidents, one specific one stands out. That bloke at the far-right political rally is Dmitry Rogozin. Rogozin was the Deputy Prime Minister for the Defence Industry of Russia between 2011 and 2018, which means it's likely he was part of the team that ousted Sertyukov. After his time running the Russian defence industry, he took over control of Roscosmos between 2018 and 22, and hilariously, for someone who was always uh, involved in the far right of politics and the interesting character that he is, he was the ambassador to NATO between 2008 and 2011. Now, because he doesn't currently have a government job, but he does have a lot of money and an opportunity to build his public profile, he's been leading a group that has occasionally gone into Ukraine known as the Tsar's Wolves. Ostensibly, this is a volunteer advisory unit, which I believe he funds, the objective of which is to test experimental weapons and technology in the Ukraine war. Now, Rogozin does not get along with all the other members of this story, including, notably, Prigozhin, which makes the next part of this story particularly interesting. Now, as the story goes, on the 21st of December, Rogozin and a number of his allies and associates were gathered at a hotel in the Donbass. According to everyone except for Rogozin, this was for his birthday, and according to Rogozin, it was a working meeting. Which tells me that even when you're an oligarch, there are people who are out there who will try and write off personal expenses as business ones. Just before 8pm in the evening, this totally not a birthday party was hit by several precision artillery shells fired by the Ukrainian military. A number of his associates were killed, many were wounded, including Rogozin himself. When Rogozin came out the next day, he alleged his location had been leaked and immediately speculation started. And the list of people with opportunity and motive were pretty long. Some people pointed out that Wagner had roasted Rogozin for wearing some Gucci, NATO, expensive military gear in the past, and Prigozhin had come out and said that Wagner units are trained to eliminate personnel wearing NATO gear, and if they see someone in NATO equipment, they would send the body back for verification in a plastic bag. Again, the evidence on who fed the intelligence, if anyone to the Ukrainians, is very light on the ground. But the fact that Rogozin made the accusation, and the fact the idea is even credible, points to the dysfunction of the culture in place. Whether or not anything nefarious took place in this incident, the issue of the crossed incentives remains. From a military perspective, it's really bad if your units start leaking each other's locations to Ukrainian artillery gunners. But from the point of view of self-interest and the chance to eliminate a political opponent, well, it makes perfect sense. And that, more than any single incident, is a problem. But so far, all of these examples speak to, ultimately, the relationships and the games played between individuals. They talk about duplicative structures, a lack of coordination, and sometimes outright and damaging rivalry. But there's one final way I wanted to talk about in which politics can damage a war effort. And that's when political incentives start to dictate not just who fights a war, but how it's fought and for what aims. Now make no mistake, wars are all fought for political reasons, ultimately. 
Hopefully there aren't many people out there who think that war should be an end in and of itself. But throughout history, political incentives are often dictated not just that a war be fought, but that it be fought in a way that defies military logic. And here too, I think it's fair to say that the Russian war effort has suffered for political reasons. Russia allowed Ukraine many, many months of head start on the mobilization process, holding back on mobilization for what were ultimately, likely, political reasons. When opposition online or on Russian state TV followed after a major military defeat, well then inevitably there was a large missile strike on Ukrainian infrastructure to steady everyone's nerves and give the feeling of progress, even if no progress was being made. And then there are all the times throughout history and in this conflict that political leadership have decided that an object or a town needed to be held at all costs, or needed to be taken at all costs, not because of reasons of military utility, but because the political value of a defeat or a victory was seen as more important than the lives of the troops involved. In a system where lives are cheap and appearance is everything, then troops can be asked to die or missiles can be slammed into apartment buildings, not for major strategic objectives or national survival, but for a bump in approval ratings or a dot point on the evening news. So taken together, what are the collective costs of politics, factionalism and perverse incentives to military performance? So far as the political rivalries within Russia itself, it seems that the chapter we were in has had a sort of ending. As the battle raged in Solidar, Surovikin, who was the general who was commanding all Russian forces in Ukraine, who was backed by Prigozhin and Kadyrov, was demoted, and Gerasimov was put in charge, something that most interpret as representing the MOD reasserting control over the war effort. What that means for the Russian war effort in Ukraine remains to be seen, although the first actions aren't encouraging on whether old wounds will be mended. One of the first things that's reportedly been done to help put Russian forces back on the path to victory is the banning of facial hair like beards, which, as you can imagine, was not well received by Kadyrov and his troops, who often wear beards for religious or cultural reasons. And you can bet that if Gerasimov is unable to deliver, well then, Prigozhin and Kadyrov will be there to help tear him down. Because that is exactly the kind of behaviour that the system rewards. So the inevitable final question, as with corruption, is can this issue be fixed, whether in the Russian army or in organisations around the world? And to this I'd say, and I think I've illustrated, Russia's problems aren't unique. Wherever there are humans, there will be in-groups and out-groups, there will be politics and misaligned incentives. I mean, just across the border in Ukraine, they also have a very fragmented military system at the moment. You have National Guard units, Territorial Defense units, and regular army units, as well as forces associated with the Border Guards or the SBU. Many responded to my video on Russian corruption by saying that corruption exists in many places, to which my response is, sure, but that doesn't stop it being really, really damaging in Russia's case. And while the problem exists everywhere, that doesn't mean it exists at the same level everywhere. Germany and Britain are no strangers to politics, but I can't imagine their defence ministers founding private armies. There are a variety of solutions to this problem that come to mind. The first and most obvious is to align incentives. Make sure that your structure rewards people who do the right thing by the whole and punish people who do the wrong thing. That sounds really simple, but it can be hard in practice. In politics and major organisations, checks, balances and structures can all help. If people are incentivized to promote friends and allies over the competent, well then maybe you need an independent auditor to inspect their promoting and hiring decisions, with them being incentivized to find evidence of improper decision making. And beyond that, the old adage goes that culture eats strategy for breakfast. If a culture doesn't view that sort of self-sitting politicking as acceptable, then people are less likely to get away with it. Ukraine's military is relatively fragmented. But so far, under the existential strain of having to defend their country, the evidence is that they're fighting together relatively well. And I haven't seen any evidence that the other parts of those combined forces have, for example, tried to undermine Zhaluzhny and his position as commander-in-chief of the unified war effort. Building that sort of culture is hard, and not everyone has the threat of incoming invasion and destruction to stimulate change. But some might ask the question, regardless, can Russia change? And while this may be more of a question for the Kremlin watchers and the organisational psychologists out there, I think there are reasons to suggest that's unlikely. The problem with fixing this issue in Russia is that it requires changing the system in Russia. 
In a personal assistant like this one, the leader is most secure when they rely on division, competition between subordinates, divided power groups, and selecting people on the basis of loyalty rather than just competence. And many of those same incentives apply to those below. And in that sort of scenario, the first person to make a change or a reform is deeply vulnerable. If you give up your armed wing, if you start selecting subordinates, not from your friends and allies and on the basis of loyalty, but just on the basis of competence, well, then you're pretty quickly going to weaken your power base. And while others might copy your lead and also reform, they could also just take advantage of the fact you're now weak, bump you off and take over your patch. If Putin was to consolidate the command of all of Russia's various armed forces under one individual selected for competence rather than loyalty, well, then Putin has to deal with someone who controls all of Russia's armed forces, who is competent and may build up the popularity, the influence or the capacity to threaten his position. You can't play divide and conquer without any division. And in that sense, you can start to see the relationship between these political incentives and the other topics I've covered, corruption and the culture of deception. These three phenomena interact in a way that probably isn't unfamiliar to those of you who lived in several Warsaw Pact states, or post-Warsaw Pact states for that matter. The political incentives explain why leadership have every reason to create divided and duplicative structures to set subordinates against each other and to select people based on loyalty rather than competence. Corruption functions both as a motivation, that is a reason people want to climb to the top of the totem pole in the first place because there's opportunities for self-enrichment to be had, but also as a tool for securing loyalty. Whether this takes the form of buying loyalty by turning a blind eye to corruption, giving someone a job they don't deserve, or directly paying kickbacks, or whether it takes the form of using corruption charges, because everyone is guilty, to eliminate anyone who tries to rock the boat or challenge your power doesn't really matter. It's a critical component regardless. And because government based on patronage, loyalty and competition and corruption isn't really the best and most efficient way to run a country, It'll always mean the army is weaker than it should be, that industry is less profitable and productive than it should be. And at that point, lies step in to reject reality and substitute it with something more acceptable, so that the corruption and the system can go on. Previously, I used the word vranio. A more accurate one might be, and apologies to any Russian speakers for this pronunciation, ochkov teralitsva. That is yet another Russian word for lying, usually used when you're lying to make something sound a lot better than it is, often yourself. Take away any one of these three limbs and the system becomes unstable. Without lies, the system has to deal with the consequences of its own inadequacy. And both day-to-day -day functioning and securing public support becomes very difficult. Without corruption, systems of patronage and purchase loyalty become difficult to sustain. And without a political system that encourages division, duplication, and competition, well, then the central power structure behind it all becomes vulnerable. But likewise, it's hard to see how you overcome any of these three features while the other two remain in place. Maybe the management consultants over at Wagner Group have a couple of ideas. In conclusion, when individual or clique goals and incentives deviate from collective goals, politics and factionalism can become a real problem. In the Russian case, like many other cases around the world and throughout history, the system rewards traits and behaviours other than skill, merit and the achievement of collective goals. Loyalty, for example, is a critical trait. In Ukraine, those perverse incentives, those problems, have manifested in a variety of ways. Barriers to reform in the Russian army leading up to the conflict, the fragmentation of the force into many competing segments with duplicative structures, cohesion and coordination issues, and in some cases, allegedly, potentially outright conflicts and sabotage. This is not a problem that is unique to Russia, and this is not a hit piece on Russia itself. These incentives, these issues, just like corruption and lies, can pose a threat to almost any organisation, any military, any country. But what I have tried to do is put forward some evidence of these incentives playing out in Ukraine and the way they have diminished Russian military effectiveness. I'd also suggest these problems aren't without solutions. They're battled and dealt with around the world. But my suggestion is those sort of changes, in terms of accountability and cultural adjustment, are antithetical to the way the Russian system is configured, and that anyone who attempts serious reform is in serious danger of the system reacting against it.
It also doesn't mean the Russian army is incapable of fighting or incapable of winning victories. But just as with corruption, this sort of division explains why the army will always be less efficient than it should be, and why the price of political competition at the highest levels of government may be more wooden boxes coming home in the back of a Kamaz. Thank you very much for listening, and I will be back next week.